Right. Oh, right. Find the wires. Find the wires. Ah! <laughs> ah, freeze our lights, everyone! Right. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh. Sorry I'm late, I've got a note. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Uh, should, can I ask yet, or what, what the box is? It, it's a side event suitcase. <laughs> right. And if you press that little button, a whole server mic could pop. It's a block doll. <laughs> No, no, no. No, it's, it's a, a, a company gave me this case. They made it for me, especially, you know, and it's great because it's hard wearing. And if you go on holiday or abroad, it, it's very deep. So you put photographs, you pack your passport, whatever, your wallet, it fits in perfectly. Excellent. That's perfectly. So, Fraser, can I start by asking you? No. Um, please. <laughs> <laughs> What's your earliest memory, full stop? Everything. What? Oh, my earliest memory. My earliest memory. Uh, living in Harrogate, Yorkshire, and uh, Diane Taylor had her, her mum and dad had a sweet shop, and swapping a kiss for a Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, earning money in those days. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, the very strange thing is, years ago I was doing an interview for a newspaper, and he said, "So Fraser." Tell me, why were you born in Harrogate? I said I wanted to be near my mother. <laughs> so, so how did acting become part of your life? Was it something that featured in your family? Well, my mother was uh, in the amateur dramatics with my dad. We lived in Harrogate, Yorkshire, so every Saturday uh, I'd go to Marjorie Newbury's dance class, I would learn tap and ballet and all that sort of stuff. And then she did, a, every year she did a, a show at the um, Winter Gardens in Harrogate. And we weren't very rich, so my, I was doing an impression of Maurice Chevalier doing Louise. So my mother got this potato sacking, cut it up, made it into a suit, dyed it white. And I can't stand that scratchy stuff next to my skin, I'm really kind of itchy. So when I sang the song, Every Little Breeze Seems to Whisper Do Ears, and I had to do the dance, stiff-legged, Every Little, because I didn't want them rubbing. And the newspaper went, seven-year-old, stop show. He even had the Morris Chevalier stiff stiff-legged walk. And somebody in Corona School, which is in London, saw it somehow, and asked my mother, could I join Corona? And she said, no, he's too young, he's seven years old, wait till he's ten. And then, ten years old, I was still didn't mind going to, to dancing classes, and, and so I went to Corona School, and it was... Dennis Waterman, Susan George, uh, Francesca Annis, you know, it was a nice class to be in, yeah. Richard O'Sullivan. Yeah. Did that mean moving the whole family down though, presumably? No, so? my mum went with me, my dad stayed in Harrogate, because uh, he was a malting manager, and I don't know what he did, for, he took me to his work one day, went to this oast house, sniffed some malt, put it back, and we went home, so that's, <laughs> my dad <laughs> sniffed malt for a living, you know. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's all he did. So did you start working whilst you were still at the Corona? Oh, you're at Corona School, you're allowed to work. Oh yes, mm -hmm. you're allowed to act. So, yeah. And my first film ever is on Talking Pictures TV now and again. It's called John and Julie. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I played the 438th citizen. In other words, you know, mm -hmm. you can't see me. Yeah. Um, it, it was a, a crowd scene. And you start with a crowd scene and then you, then you do a two, two lines in a film and then the director likes you and he puts you, gives you a bigger part, and in the end you, you go on. But I, I, I owe my career really to Sean Sutton, because he, he got me into, he was producing, directing the BBC, Hunting Tower, mm. by John Buchan, and I played Napoleon, and he liked what I did, and then kind of the year later, I did Jan in The Silver Sword, mm. which kind of put a name to this little cherubic face, and then I was part of the, the Sean Sutton sort of repertory company. Um, we did Sunday shows every Sunday, sort of. Like. Well, Hunting Tower is one I wanted to ask about because you must have been 12 or 13. Uh, yeah, about 12, yes. Yeah. And it was six episodes. Presumably it was, was it live or? <coughs> it was, it was live TV. Uh, Doody Nemo w w was the lead. And it was, we did it at Lime Grove. Mm. And it was supposed to be sh shot in the winter and it was hot. And we, we were doing scenes, well, and we were sweating, going, hey, Mr. Marcon, it's very, 
really cold in here and we're sweaty because it's really hot. Because mm. there's no a a a AC in, in Lime Grove. Yeah. What was the pressure like on you though as a 12 or 13 year old knowing that what you were doing was going out live? Was it, was it something that put the fear into you or did you take to it like a duck to water? I just took to it like a duck to water. I've always said this and when I do stage plays, I always say, to, you know, opening night, I said, listen, if we cock it up, nobody dies. If a surgeon cocks it up, somebody dies. Mm. So it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to put you against a wall and shoot you. Yeah. And that's the way I've always looked at, at show business. Mm. In the same year as Hunting Tower, is that the same year that you worked with Charlie Chaplin? Uh, would, would that, yeah, it probably would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah I think um, so, yeah. That was in uh, uh, The King of New York. Mm. And he was a lovely man, you know. Uh, again, because we've been doing a lot of movie children's film foundation films as a young kid, which was great grounding for when you're working with grown-up actors, I suppose. Um, and, and Chaplin was, you know, Mr. Chaplin, you know, nice man, he, you know, we all knew who he was. He wasn't, he didn't have a curly wig and a, you know, bowler hat. Uh, and he was a lovely man, and he said, do you know when stars are bright and shiny from Tosca? I said, no. He said, well, you just sing what you think is opera. So I was, and he said, you're picking your nose like that, and you're making holes for cakes. And he showed me what to do, Leonardo, he went up to, he went up to the oven, oh, shit, put the stuff in, close the door, da, da, da. Right, you do it, Fraser. So I went, la 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 Oh, shit, la 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 And he, <laughs> he burst out laughing. I said, well, was, was that funny, Mr. Chaplin? And he said, you know what it was, Fraser? Well, I was showing you what to do. An art light had been leaning against the handle of the oven, and it was hot. So that's when I touched it, it was, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 I don't want you to do that. <laughs> and I think he took me, because I, I got home that night, and my mother said, you told him how to sing this. No. So she got the music stand out and found it and made me sing this song, learn, learn the song. So the next day he's working, there's a break in film, and I said, Mr. Chaplin, yes, Razor. I said, I went, la 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 so he liked that, and later on I said to him, I've got an idea for some comedy. Now instead of him going, I'm Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> I've written, produced, directed, and, and you, 12, clip right here. He said, what's your idea of comedy? I said, well, you've got a fur hat on. If I put some of my cream into your hat, you wouldn't have, he said, no, I'd see the cream. But if you make it into a cake, and I sit in it, then we have the comedy. And he'd listen to a 12-year-old kid. And I've always done that when I'm doing pantomimes. If one of the babies says, Fraser, 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 I've got a new joke. I never go, listen, kid, I know lots of jokes. Mm. I'll listen to that kid, because Charlie Chaplin listened to me. Yeah. So, and at that time, you were doing a, such a huge amount of work. That I, I had a look, and I think it was something like, uh, somewhere in the, in the early 60s, there was one year where you had at least 10 different TV jobs and four film jobs. But they're across every single genre. You know, you're, you're doing comedy, you're doing drama. And w what was it that made you able to avoid typecasting? Or was it just there was so much work? I'm sorry, that's all we've got time for now. <laughs> 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 uh, no, no, you learn, that, that's, what you, that's the good thing about Corona School, where, where I went. Monday, all through the week, you got the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. In the afternoon, you might get tap Monday, Ballet Tuesday, saw fighting Wednesday, Shakespeare Thursday. You had to learn everything. So I think that covered, you know, it was great grounding. You know, we were just, we could do comedy, we could do drama, we could do everything. It was, it was Corona, Corona Academy. Yeah. Brilliant. And then we come to a program called Smuggler's Bay, and that's the first time you encounter, presumably, Mr. Patrick Trout. That's right. It was um, originally from the book Moonfleet, mm. uh, my famous author, I forgot his name. But the BBC at the time had a moon strike on about the Lysander aircraft in World War II. Mm. And they didn't want two, two moons, so to speak. So they called it Smuggler's Bay. Mm. And that's where I love it. Uh, I love I love Suzanne Neve. Oh, God, she was gorgeous. But no, uh, Patrick Trout. And, and I was the star, and he just had played old Ratsy, uh -huh. a smuggler. And about two years later, he was the star. And I'm, I was coming in just for four episodes mm. of, of, of Doctor Who. Mm. And, and when you came in for those four episodes, um, 
when did you become aware that it was going to be substantially more than four episodes? Uh, well, it was. We did we did all the pre filming first. You do all that obviously. So if you come into the TARDIS and it's been raining on occasion, obviously when you do the studio, you're going to be wet. Um, so we, the first, I think the second episode had gone out, and Innes Loy, lovely Innes Loy, uh, old Navy man, came, put his arms around me. Fraser, how do you how do you fancy joining the old TARDIS crew for a year? I said, I can't do that. He said, oh, don't, don't you like the show? I said, oh, I love it. I said, but we filmed me, a French and Ponds, mm. waving goodbye to the TARDIS and staying with Kirsty, um, Hannah Gordon and Donald Blizzard, waving goodbye. He said, oh, hell with that. Um, we'll film it again. So he took me in his little VW uh, Beetle. About two days later, we went to French and Ponds, and this time I got into the TARDIS and waved goodbye to my lad and, and Kirsty. And that started three of the happiest years of my life in show business. Working with Patrick and, and Debbie, of course, and, and Padders, you never ever felt driving to work, and I know some companions later on, I thought, oh, I hope so and so's in a good mood today. I hope she hasn't, I hope he hasn't fallen in I hope he hasn't been on the, we never ever felt, it was a joy to go to work. And if I hadn't spent the money, I'd give it back to the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> so, who was Patrick Trouton to you? He was a best mate. He was a really, a, 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 he was idiosyncratic. I mean, those hush puppies he wore were his. He wore them in rehearsals and he wore them with the doctor. And he, had, he used to have a little knitted, a knitted bag with him. And I said, well, I'll get you a nice briefcase. No, 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 no. And he loved his little knitted bag. But a, a little uh, story I was telling you earlier today. He had a lovely Rover 2000, not a lovely Rover car. And I saw, Motorsport magazine, and it, 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 there's, um, in Brussels there's a, a, a statue called the Mannequin Pies, which is a little boy, and he's peeing, and obviously, hey, and that's, the, that's the, the fountain. And I saw in this magazine you could get screen washers for your car, where you put them on the bonnet and you press. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Patrick, oh, you could get these screen washers, you've got to get them. Oh, no, don't be silly. No, of course there is. I said, there is. I'll bring the magazine in. So the next day I brought the magazine in. Uh, I, I, I went home to get the magazine and my mum threw it away. So the next day I went to Pat, he said, oh, don't tell me about that bloody thing again. I said, honestly, you can find them. He said, no, no, he said, but, uh, I'll bet you 10 quid. I said, I'll bet you 10 quid then. I'll bet you 10 quid. I'll come up with it. And on the way home, I saw this car showroom and in it was a second hand Rover 2000, a white one, and on the bonnet, two little silver boys. So I went in and said, how much of my car? Right, I wrote a check out. In those days, you could just, none of these HPIs and stuff. So the next day I went to rehearsal and said, Patrick, he said, oh, you're not going to talk about that bloody thing. I said, I bet you 10 quid I can prove it. He said, oh, all right, prove it. So I took him out into the car park. And he said, oh, gosh, you're right. I said, what's this? <laughs> how did you open the Wait a minute, is that your car? I said, yes. <laughs> You bought a car, I said, yes, yeah, just to get 10 quid off you, you type. <laughs> and that 10 quid is like 100 pounds of today, yes, by yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Can we talk about, a little bit about directors? Because what, what's the difference that a good director makes? Because I think we've all looked at, say, for example, The Web of Fear. We were talking to Sue about uh, W. Campfield. Yeah. When The Web of Fear turned up, it looked beautiful throughout. And then if we compare it maybe with um, The Dominators, for example, yeah. which doesn't look quite as beautiful, even though it has uh, Ronald Allen in, and I quite agree yeah. with the previous panel about Ronald Allen, but is, is that the difference a director makes? A director can let you fool around in rehearsal, and he knows that when the re red light comes on, you know, that's it. But we, we've had some, Dougie Canfield was, was terrific. I, I mean, there used to be a little anteroom off the rehearsal room with a, a, a pool table that we, we used to play cards on. And Dougie would come in, are you boys coming to work or not? Oh, no, we, we know the lines, I've got a good hand here. I'm, honestly, we, we're, do, we're doing the lines now, Dougie. We, we, we know the lines, you know. But then you get somebody like, oh, well, shall I mention his name? Um, yes, apparently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you get some people who, when we did the um, Tomb of the Cybermen, um, and we knew that if we suggested this gag, he would say, 
No. Maurice Barry. Um, so Patrick had this idea. Instead of taking Victoria's hand, which was in the script, we take each other's hand. And of course, we couldn't say how far are you cutting because they would, well, why do you want to know how? So we did it on the take. Come on, come on, Victoria. <laughs> Victoria, come on, and carry on the seat and cut. And it, Morris was, was annoyed. I came up with, and, it, and luckily, um, Peter Bryant was the producer. He said, No, no, no. Actually, that was just what we needed. We had somebody electrocuted on the gates. Zzz. Toblerone comes up and he goes zzz, and he opens the gates and you come in and it's all tense, tense, tense and you guys just went, oh, a little bit of humour. Mm. He said, that's just what he needed. So that's what you know, Peter Bryan let, let, let us keep it in. But Morris was, oh, he'd, he'd get to the studio and go, uh, the sets are on, my team, my cameras are there. Uh, we'll move the cameras on. No, no, we had to move the sets and we broke the coffee and the guys were, oh, bloody hell. Mm. Yeah. So it's the di that a director really can make all the difference to oh. the show, even a long running show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I say, well, Ducky Hamfield was one of our favourites. We would suggest something, and he'd go, all right, boys, you can keep that joke in. <laughs> but, he, but he had a sense of humour. In The Invasion, there's a scene where we, we get into the Rolls Royce of, of um, Tobias Vaughan, and he said, Fred, you get in the back seat. And come out the back seat and then jump in the shotgun. So when Packard comes, you're going, hello. And that was Dougie's idea. It wasn't in the script. Yeah. So he was a very creative man as yes. well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Of, yeah. And in, in the beginning of the invasion, he, uh, this was supposed to be walking down the street and then they're following us. I said, Dougie, can we do a, like a cartoon thing? Uh, what do you mean cartoon? I said, well, we started walking, we realised we've been following. We sort of walk a bit quicker. In the end, yes, like it, like it. Mm. One of, the, one of the things, I suppose, though, that's quite sad about the era is there is an awful lot still missing. Have you got any memories of any, just like, little moments that it would be brilliant for us to be able to see? Oh, I'd love them to find the Highlanders. I really would. Uh, um, it was a lovely story. Um, some lovely actors in it, obviously. Um, I think I'd love them to find the Highlanders. Mm. Not because of my first story. But it's my favourite story because obviously, uh, when I think about it, um, if I hadn't done those four episodes, I would not have toured Australia, New Zealand, America, uh, and Liverpool. I've never seen any of them. So, I mean, you were on the show um, for, for three years yeah. because it was 40 weeks a year. It never felt like hard. Somebody said, was it hard work? Like, going down a mine is, high, uh, is hard work. Mm. Uh, punching a thousand washers an hour with an ear, that's hard. Yeah, there'll be days you think, oh, crack, I've got 25 pages of dialogue. Oh, I can't go out tonight, I've got to learn these lines. Mm. Of course, there's days like that, but most days it was just. It was fun. But I can't remember, I seem to remember, do a few episodes, summer holiday. A few episodes, Christmas holiday. Mm. A few episodes, summer holiday. It never felt like that. 40 weeks a year. Mm. I mean, they, they get, you see, 40 weeks a year, there's still 12 weeks left. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so, so plenty of time to, to enjoy yourself. Yeah, now that's true. Mm. So, ultimately, what was it that made you decide that's, that's enough? My agent. My agent, Hazel Malone, said, Darling, you've done three years now, and you must go back to films. Because my early career, as you pointed out earlier, television was in its infancy. So my early career was doing movies. And she said, do you must do more films. And I said, I'm oh, enjoying myself. No, 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 you must do more films. Uh, and then I was going to leave. And it was all in the papers, Patrick, uh, Dr. Lucy, Jamie, and Patrick, oh, you're, you're not leaving. I said, yeah. No, 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 he said, my, my contract finishes in six months' time. Wait, and we'll all leave together. So my agent rang BBC and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, fine, we'll live together. But I still say, if it hadn't been for, because his wife was nagging him. Oh, come on, you, you're doing children's television. Now. You're a man of your own children's television. <laughs> And my age, you know, if we hadn't had those two people nagging us, we'd still be there. You would never have heard of David Tennant, because he? <laughs> <laughs> He'd have to shoot us to get us out of time. <laughs> so, then you went back, of course. Oh, that was great fun. Well, I was supposed to go back for the whole of The Five Doctors, mm. uh, but Yorks TV wouldn't release me from Emmerdale. I said, well, look, can I just have an extra week on my summer holiday? No, no, no. So I rang JNT, and he said, well, I want you in it, I want you in it. If you get two days off, let me know. And I got some, I said, oh, I've got 
schedule. I've got next Wednesday, Thursday off. He said, right, you're in. And that night there was a fact, uh, a fact, that's how long ago it came, and the nails my lines. Aye, no, the dogs are right, the big nails are right. Ah! <laughs> 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 Oh, you know, I had my day off, but I wanted to see Patrick mm. and Wendy again. So we went to the Acton Hilton, and then all the other doctors, Pertwee and, and, and uh, Colin, um, you know, Colin, and we, we just saw each other, we jumped on each other, we rolled on the floor, laughing and giggling, and John Pertwee said, Tell me, Jane, you never done it, tell me, Jane, tickle me, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> make me laugh, make me laugh, you know, and Peter Davidson said, come on, girls, you, come, you never did that to me in the TARDIS. <laughs> And it was great. And then when I was getting derigged to go back to Yorkshire, J and T said, Fraser, it was like you and Patrick have been in a prop cupboard for 16 years and we just doesn't. Would you do more? So we just please. And that's why we did the two doctors. Mm. So if I had said, can't be asked to do the five doctors, I would never done the two doctors. Yeah. So what was the experience of the two doctors then? Because it, it, well, that was great. We was originally were supposed to go to New Orleans. And we thought, oh, New Orleans. And an American money pulled out. He said, well, we're still going to, um, to Seville. And that was great. We, we, we flew to Seville. Uh, Peter Moffat, he was a lovely, lovely director. And the wig went missing. Uh, so we had three days going fancy by the pool. And in the end, the, the wardrobe girl, the makeup girl, said, look, we, we can't wait for three days. So we'll, we'll have you over and pull your hair, and Dastari's hair like this, and Chassini's hair like that. And we filmed, and filmed, filmed, and filmed. It was such a happy shoot. But we filmed, finished one night, and Peter Moffat came to the bar because we were all in the park. Yeah, I mean, he said, well, um, are we finished? I've shot everything. Really? Yeah, I've, I've, I've shot everything. I, but we can't go back because the, the higher jet, I mean the passenger jet, is not due for two days. Um, the hotel's still booked for two days. So I suggest if you go back to your rooms tonight and you find stuff in your script that you think we could actually put on location We'll do that. So the next day we came out for breakfast and Colin said, you know that scene where I'm doing so? He said, why not I'm listening outside and I fall off the beer crate and bang. Mm -hmm. And then Chusini goes, oh, is that you know? And I said, well, how about if I did this, that, and the other? And, and, and Nicola Bryan said, well, I could do. And so we actually shot next in two days because it was such a, normally if you get two days behind shooting, you actually have to drop scenes. Yeah. And we, we had, but we added scenes. And it's like, and Peter Moffat was a lot. I mean, a lot of people say they didn't like the two doctors, but Peter Moffat was a lovely man. Mm. And, and, great, and great fun. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's open uh, up to the floor. Uh, have we got any questions for Fraser? Yes, straight away, yeah. Uh, and you watched Outlander, which is kind of based on your character. Yes, uh, in fact, I was a bit disappointed. But I, I, I obviously saw it, and, and I thought, oh, good, they're going to make a TV se series. Uh, hopefully, I'll be in it somewhere. And then they. They offered me that episode 15, uh, went with prison in the first series. And of course, uh, with social media, I, that was the most watched episode of the first series because I think I put a million Doctor Who fans <laughs> in watching it <laughs> to see what Fraser's going to be up to. Yeah. But I met Diana Gavaldon, you know, I met her uh, in Edinburgh doing a book signing. She was doing a book signing. And he said, Yes, Fraser, I, I watched you, I think it must have been the War Games. I, I, she said, I went to church the next day, and all I could think of was, your kilt and your legs, so I came back. <laughs> she said, I have to write this thing. And she said, obviously, I can't wear a ta I write a TARDIS. So she did this time travel thing. But, you know, I'd like to have been in a few more episodes, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Because you inspired it at the end of the day. Yes, it was. Your she, she actually called it the character Jamie Fraser. Mm. And I said, well, Jamie, obviously, from, yeah, and Fraser, she said, well, actually, no, it, it's how strange because uh, with PBS, American, the minute the show's over, the, 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 the captions are like that. She said, I never saw your, your real name. Oh. But how could we, she could have called him Jamie McDonald, Jamie whatever, but called him Jamie Fraser. Which, wow. you know, yeah. Was, uh, Any more questions? Because I, well, what people are thinking, mm. uh, she sent me her, the first book, Cross Stitch, mm. to, to Yorkshire TV. And, and I read it, and I took it to um, our head of drama. I said, and I, this, I'm going back 40 years now. Right. I said, we should make this in my summer break, and I'll play, you know, Jamie. Yeah. And I would, we don't have to shoot it in Scotland, we can shoot it in Yorkshire. I mean, it's still Heather and... And they said, oh, no, it'd be too expensive to make. I said, yeah, but it's great to see it. Look, read the book. Mm. And they said, no, we, we can't, you know, we're not going to do it. Yorkshire Television could have made Outlander. Yeah. 
What happened in television then? Because it seems like you were working in this real golden age of television, mm. but then it changed, didn't it? Something changed in television. Love that Island. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Is it is it to do with cash? Because that probably is cheaper and drama costs. Or, or? I, well, I, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's cash. They're, good. they're getting all these new people who want to be famous, mm. and they'll pay them like I don't know, a couple of hundred quid, whereas proper actors would be, you know, a lot more. Yeah. And it's cheap television. There's no script writing. You know, you don't have to pay a script writer. No rehearsal. No, no rehearsal. We just put, you know, six, ten, ten people into a. A room and let, let them get on with it, you know. Really. Yeah. No, not not good television. No, no. And that's why, in fact, I actually foresaw Gogglebox about eight or nine years ago. I, I said, TV is getting so bad that we're going to start watching people watching TV, mm. and people laughed at me. Yes. And that's the, that's Gogglebox. We're watching people watching TV and hearing what their thoughts are. Tell them your own thoughts. You, really? Mm. I, I've, I've written a show called Celebrity Paint Dry. Yeah. <laughs> we paint a wall, and we guess whose wall will dry quicker. Well, I think I can speak for anyone, but everyone here, when I say that we're very glad that you've worked in that wonderful golden era of television. Oh. I think we should uh, probably wrap it up, Erica, about now, should we? One more question. We'll oh, yeah, one oh, yeah. more question. All right. Okay. Fraser. Yeah. Oh, uh, Sundown, yes. Yeah, Ryan Hendrick, a young uh, up-and-coming director, he, he wrote this thing called Sundown. Uh, it, it was a two-hander. It was two-hander. Um, <laughs> and he, he had me and Caitlin Blackwood in it. And it, it's about a guy meeting a, a girl on this lovely island. You can get it, actually, if you look on... YouTube, I think if you type in Sundown, mm. you get it, and it's a very, very moving, so I don't want to give any spoilers, but it took us three days to get to Iona, and it rained the whole time, oh, I, but the minute we got to Iona, the sun came out, ding, and it was wonderful, and those four days, because it's a lot of, all on location, and we're walking across the island, or if it'd been raining, you'd have lost, well, you lose it, uh, and then, Ryan and I got on really well together, so he said, I'm doing this um, film called Lost at Christmas. And, uh, and I want to get you to play um, well, another Doctor Who actor. I said, well, Sylvester, we be great. We play Highlanders, all right. So we shot that on an occasion. Again, it, it's on, I think it's streaming or whatever you call it. It's called uh, Lost at Christmas. And the two leads are fantastic. It's about two people that meet. But um, Pat, uh, Patrick, God uh, bless him. He, uh, Sylvester and I, we met in the bar, in the bar before, and he said, um, Fraser, you know, we're Highland, well, let's, let's do it with a Highland accent. <laughs> I said, why? He said, well, if it's just a Scottish accent, you say to me, fancy a drink. But if you're a Highlander, you'll be like, would you be after having a wee dram or whiskey? He said, more on TV, more on screen, longer. So we did this first scene, and Ryan said, cut. I know what you two buggers are. <laughs>